So our last lecture was a little bit technical, definitely the most technical that will go on, and I think like, today we can have like a bit more of a, a chill pace. But since we never got to actually see this like process of nested cross-validation, that actually rather than um, like it's helpful when you have to optimize parameters, but actually its real goal is to be able to uh, estimate the generalization error in a fair way. And so I thought, okay, let's at least look at it one time, and then we'll move on to regression. So far, we've been considering classification problems, and you know, we'll use like the same algorithm. So we'll discuss a little bit what are the differences, uh, which I don't think there are that many. So if you guys have this notebook that we had, uh, I'm just going to actually restart it so we can like follow again if you weren't here uh, last week. So it's a bit scary. Yes. <laughs> okay. And so here you have like the first cell is just inputs. And to play around, I'm using this like toy data set, which is the digit data set. It's a very well-known data set, but this is actually something that is much simpler compared to the original. Although I have the link to the original because I feel like it's also fun uh, if you want to try uh, new algorithms on it. And so the one that is included in Scikit-Learn is a smaller version that we can um, import directly from the data set uh, module. And we can actually uh, plot a bunch of them. And this is like 10, 10. So we're going to look at the first 100 objects from this data set. And here we go. And so you can see that this is just like a set of handwritten digits. Uh, They're pretty old that are a classic pen class classification problem. And the original data set is 28 by each object is a matrix, so 28 by 28, so 784 features. This is like a much reduced one, which is in which each object is 8 by 8, so there are 64 features for each object that are just the brightness in each pixel. And there are around 1,800 objects, while the original one had 70,000. And so this is meant to be like a bit more portable and you know, easier to play with. So last time we talked about support vector machines, and in particular we use support vector classifiers. So you know, just our default model was this one. And now by now I think we're hopefully all familiar with this cross-validation score function that just does like the simplest cross-validation. If you don't say anything, it will have three splits. I usually if you have the CPU time, I would recommend doing at least five just to get an idea of how much the scores fluctuate. And so here you can see that uh, the scores, and this is accuracy. So if we want to make sure that accuracy is a decent scorer, what should we check? In which case does accuracy fail? when the data set is unbalanced, right? Because accuracy is just the percentage of correct classification. So if you have a case in which one class is dominant, typically you can achieve a high accuracy just by assigning all elements to that class. So this is not the case, but to convince ourselves, we could say, hey, you know, let me take a look at the histogram of the labels. Uh, and you can see actually that they are almost uniformly distributed among the 10 possible classes, which are the digits 0 through 9. So in this case, this is fine. We can trust accuracy as being like a fair scorer for this classifier. And now we said, OK, let's see actually. Let's take a look at the mean of these scores. So it's around 95%. So it's honestly not bad. And I mean, no, real research problems hardly ever look like the digits data set. But let's say that we want to do a little bit better, and so we want to optimize this. Uh, so what you have here is uh, an implementation of this method called grid search cross-validation, where you can basically provide a dictionary of the parameters you want to try out. And you know, just like in every optimization problem, uh, 
it's ideal if you can try not just one parameter at a time, but you know, like all the combinations separate or the combinations of parameters together to find the optimal point. Now, notice that here, what I'm doing is not optimal because I'm using two possible kernel. And the kernel, as we mentioned in support vector machine, is this magical mapping function that brings you from the original feature space to a higher dimensional space where hopefully your examples are more separated. And we said that the nice things about support vector machine and kernel functions is that you can demonstrate, actually somebody demonstrated, maybe you can, I didn't, I didn't go through the whole proof, but I trust Mercer theorem that says if you have a kernel matrix which is semi-positive definite, then you can actually show that uh, you can write the decision function of a support vector classifier just as the inner product of the feature in the map space, and these inner products can be rewritten as a function of the kernel. And this means that basically you never need to specify the mapping function explicitly as long as you're using a legit kernel. And so this is uh, what we use in support vector machine, and we learn that some of these kernels are the RBF, which is like a Gaussian kernel, and a polynomial kernel that considers all the possible inner products of polynomial combinations of the features. And so here, the parameters that I'm giving are these two types of kernels, and then gamma. Gamma C is a parameter that it's only related to the Gaussian kernel. It's the wiggliness of a Gaussian kernel. The higher the value of gamma, the more wiggly your boundary could be, the more you expect overfitting. Uh, and so in, you know, using several values of gamma for a polynomial kernel is a waste of time. So you know, I feel like the kernel optimization could be done separately from the other one. And similarly, I think here you have the degree of the polynomial, which of course doesn't pertain to the Gaussian kernel case. So what I'm doing here is like the simplest in terms of coding, but it's not the smartest decision that you can make in terms of timing. Anyway, these are like the parameters in dictionary form. And so this object research CV will take this and you know, will look at all the combination of parameters and do a stratified k-fold. Now stratified here just means it's going to pick folds in which the distribution of the objects is similar to the original. It's not essential when you have a balanced data set. It doesn't matter much. But in general, I feel like it's good practice. And so we left it there. And so this is how you could look for optimal parameters. And so now we're doing, I have like four folds. Let's see. Because I have verbose equal one here, I get some sort of like uh, en route information. If you have put a, a higher number, you will have like even more feedback on how this is doing. We need to have 216 total fits. And yeah, we're getting there. We got like 192. And so this gives back the best parameters and best score. And so you can see that actually you can get to almost 98.5% accuracy on this data set with this like simple parameter optimization process. And what you get there is that the best parameters were a polynomial kernel uh, with a degree of 2. I mean, gamma here is 0 0.01, but actually a sanity check would be to see that the value of gamma doesn't matter, and so they probably just pick like, the first one that uh, this happened to run. And C was like the penalty for misclassification, this penalty that is in front of the slack variables that we see, because this classifier is trying to optimize, basically, uh, the sum of the width of the margin plus uh, actually to minimize the inverse of the width of the margin plus uh, these misclassification penalties. So what I like to do is once your, if your model is a grid search object, uh, it gets an attribute called CV results. It's sort of like, you know, it's just like a table form summary of all the fits that have been performed. And we can write it in data frame form. And just because some of these columns are large, you can say, hey, you know, give me like a column width of 100 characters just so you can visualize everything. And we can look at what columns are there. And so you get like a whole bunch of information, right? For example, the mean of the fit time and its standard deviation, 
uh, the mean time that the classifier takes for scoring. Um, so this is like what happens on the test fold. Each one of the parameters individually and also their combination. Uh, the test and train score on each one of the four splits and so on. And just you know, in terms to you know to visualize the information in a bit more compact way, I decided okay, I'm going to look at the train and test scores. This is nice because comparing train and test, I can see if there is overfitting. Although, as we mentioned, uh, in general, you know, like you always want the highest test scores. So, you know, looking at how train and test scores compare is really just for the purpose to understand what's going on behind the scenes. And then I'm also looking at the parameters, just so I, I, I can know which parameters give what scores, and the mean fit time. And I'm sorting the values in this data frame uh, by a column, mean test scores. And since typically you want to visualize the highest test scores first, well, you know, the standard is the opposite. You can write if you want ascending equal false. So let's see what happens if we do this. Right? And so here you get like a whole set of combinations that have been tried out. And as we learn, the winning models in this case was this one. And these are its parameters. And as I was mentioning, we should be able to verify that, uh, where is it, tan gamma Hohen? Oh, I guess that they don't have to be exactly the same within their standard deviation. Oh. And you see that this is a model that you know, doesn't particularly suffer from overfitting. The scores are close. If you were to visualize also the standard deviation of this, it gives an idea of what's the fluctuation over the four folds. So that could also be a good idea. And then I think it's also interesting to look at what models perform poorly, just to get a sense of why. And so these are models that start to have a fairly high degree of overfitting, as you can see from the difference between train and test scores. And you can see that typically this is related to models who have either like a more complicated boundary, like you know, higher degree of the polynomial, means that typically you tend to tailor your decision function to the training set more than you should. And a similar effect happens for higher value of this misclassification penalty. Then here, see like, you know, even worse, you're looking at a Gaussian kernel with a high value of gamma, which means your boundary is very wiggly wiggly, and because of that, you have a serious degree of overfitting. And then you have this poor model that performs so bad in us, they have no idea why, but it's, I kind of feel bad for it a little bit. And it's like all there with like, you know, 20% Accuracy, even if you know, if you look at it, okay, it's like a higher degree polynomial. But so now, if we wanted to put this in a context of nested cross validation, what should we do? We said that in nested cross validation, this becomes like an inner part, but you also have some outer folds, and so basically you repeat the procedure several times, making sure that you're optimizing the parameters in the inner space, which was yellow in my slides. But then your test scores are evaluated on an outer fold that has not participated in any way to the parameter optimization process. And so it's the test scores on this outer fold that give you a better representation of generalization error. And so here, this is how this will work in code. You get basically like two for loops. And so this is like the outer cross validation. This is the inner cross validation. I put the different number of splits just so we can distinguish them, and also like it mirrors the slides. And so first, you have like an outer cross-validation split in like train and test, that happens five times. And then, inside each one of these, we run the parameter optimization problem. And let's see, can we afford to do this? I'm gonna say yes, because this took 30, about 30 seconds, so this will be like two and a half minutes. So just to make this a little bit simpler, I'm going to take out a value of gamma here. And usually higher values of gamma also are associated with higher um, run times. Let's see if this is true. This would be like the timing. 
So let's see. Hopefully this should be. So now for each fold, we have 144. And so let's see. And now we can see for the first outer fold, we get these best parameters and best scores. And then now we moved on to the second and the third. And you can see that, you know, like sometimes the parameters are slightly different. Like, you know, they're not bound to be the same best model for each one of the folds. That's okay because we are only doing this to evaluate what's the typical generalization score. So we're not even using this to pick the best model. And we are on fold five. Okay, and so basically what you want to sort of like focus on here, and sorry, like this poor format, is the average of the winning model scores, which is like how a parameter optimized internally performs on the outer test fold, is actually pretty well. 98.5% with just 0.5% or so of standard deviation. And so the performance that you can expect from your classified new data is 98.5% plus or minus, actually, I think this should render LaTeX if I put it in quote, 0.5%. Yeah, it works. And this comes from here. And so this is what Nest Cursor is. So this is like a particular case in which actually we have seen that the performance doesn't worsen when it's applied to different data. Like we have like this when we're doing like one run across validation. Now you know we would do that on the whole data set to provide the best parameters, but the generalization error is not different. However, in many cases we expected this that we found here is a little lower in terms of scores or what we expect on when you have optimized the parameters and sort of like pick the parameters to give you the highest test scores. Yeah? Is it possible to do like joint scoring? What does it mean? Like for example, if I want to like select the best model on accuracy and like the other criteria, like precision, is it possible to do like joint like automatically? I think that the way to achieve something like that is that you can write your own custom uh, scoring function and you know, if you sort of want something which is like an average or the sum, you could use that as scoring function when you do the cross validation. And so uh, here, I don't think I have it here because we're just using accuracy. But yeah, scoring here is accuracy. And so this can be uh, substituted by like any custom function that you want. And I think I had it, I can't remember if it's, yeah, in the previous notebook, you will say like at the end, there is a little section on how to implement a custom function. And so there is like a little pipeline scikit-learn called make scorer. And then, you know, you can put any function you want and just say if greater is uh, better is true or false. So you can write it as a loss or you can write it as a score. Anything else? Okay, I think we are probably ready to leave this world. I just put here two notes. One is that if you have a large parameter space, doing a grid search for every single combination can be expensive. And so like, there's also like a random search option that is available. And same thing as like, if you do learning curves, with just as a reminder, are a plot of how your performance changes as a function of the size of your data set. If you're already well in the regime where the curves are flat, meaning that you don't need more data, you may be able to just take half of your data sets to do the optimization. And you know, if you've seen that already 50% of the size of your data sets gives you a scores that are stable, then this is another way of making this process faster. And here are like two you know, exercises if you guys uh, want to play. But one of the things that is nice is like maybe looking at the original uh, Digis data set, as I mentioned, it's used for like benchmarking of all the new algorithms that come around. And so there is this page that is maintained by, oh, where does it go? Oh, I think it's because here, 
he has an extra, I don't know what my internet is doing, oh here. And so you can see here that, you know, this is like, if you want, you can download the data datasets, but I put another link that is actually easier to use. And so there's like, you know, a um, well-maintained list of different algorithms uh, and how they perform on the original one. It's a much larger data set, so, you know, I put the optimal parameters for an SVM already. I found it from like someone having done that, because the grid search optimization similar to what we run would take about two days on my machine, but it's kind of nice. Uh, here you get the test error rate. And so you can see that actually support vector machines of like different degrees are among the best single uh, algorithms that you can find. And neural nets are now of course like you know the state of the game, but you can say that even for neural network you really need to go to uh, fairly sophisticated models before you can match the accuracy of support vector machines. And so I feel like I'm following there, and CompNets actually do quite well. And so it's, you know, if you are interested in, you know, like looking at what kind of algorithms perform better on this kind of problem, this is nice. All right, any more questions? Now we are all classification experts. Yes? So to, to find the best value of the hyperparameters, yeah. people usually don't do gradient descent here. Uh, well, I guess it's a gradient descent. For the way I understand it, is like you know a way of sort of like you know moving towards the minimum of the loss function. Uh, and I think the trick there is also you're assuming that your loss function is convex. And so I feel like you know this is like you know a global optimization uh, and. Uh, yeah, so I feel like, you know, there are good things and bad things. I feel like in many uh, neural network cases, you do some sort of like gradient descent, and that's just because the number of parameters is so overwhelming that you have no other choice. So, you know, it's a trade-off because I, I guess that there, with the non-convex loss functions, you may end up in a local minimum, and then it's difficult to get out of there. But more questions? All right, so the next thing that we'll look at is regression. And so there's also, if you guys want to follow along, actually, you know, this is the one with the cheats, the one that says to fill is the one we should be going, we should be using. And so regression problems, like what's the difference between classification and regression? We're still in a supervised learning realm, but what's the new thing? The labels are numerical. Right, the labels are numerical values. And so the important thing is not even just that they're numericals, but basically that they're not classes, they're continuous outputs. So, because you know, in the case of the digits, you have like a numerical output, but you only have these finite values and they're not continuous. So in this case, we can recycle, basically, both the problems and the algorithms that we have. So I'm not gonna say too much, you know, we're, I wanna see like, you know, a worst example, but the nice things about here is that the same way that we had, for example, random forest classifier, you can use random forest regressor. And so, you know, many of the caveats about, you know, let's look at our data, let's make sure that there are not too many outliers, let's understand what kind of information it makes sense to provide, apply the same case. The one thing that is quite different is the scoring. So what's the problem in using the scoring things that we have defined so far? Yeah, you have to know how close is a match. Or... Right, so you know, you're not gonna go with right or wrong. Like if you're predicting like a numerical variable, you can assume any value. Like, you know, you're unlikely to get like a perfect match and you don't want to discard as wrong anything that is close but not exactly the same. And so basically you need to introduce new scoring parameters that keep track of how close you are to the real value as opposed to just give you a yes or no or right or wrong or correct or incorrect. And so that's actually, in my humble opinion, the main difference that there is. So what I'm gonna do is, like I wanted to do a different problem, but actually I think it's nice not to have to reintroduce data sets and issues. So I'm going to use exactly the same data set that we had 
Last time we were looking at lemon alpha emitting galaxies and O2 galaxies, and we had the simulations of those. And this was typically cast as a classification problem. Is it this type or is it this type? But for us, we can restate it as a regression problem. And so what makes sense to calculate? If I tell you, OK, how can we rewrite this as a regression problem? What would we need to do? Uh, what can we predict that is continuous in a classification problem? Rather than output in like LAE or O2, what can we output that is a continuous variable? Probability. Right, probability that an object is from one class or the other. For example, if we decide that the positive class is the O2 emitters, which is a formulation that we had, we could ask for the probability that the object belongs to that category. It's not the best example of a regression problem, obviously, <coughs> but you know, it's one way that means like, OK, we can compare it directly to what we were doing previously, and uh, it's good enough. And so what I'm doing here is basically I copied the same thing that we had from last week. So these are my data. I am renaming <coughs> the columns to something easy enough to type. These eliminated outliers defined as any column that has a value that is more than three standard deviations away from the mean. Then these took care of categorical variables and transformed it to numerical values. So the LAE02 string is turned into 0 and 1. These are signs with a warning, I'm afraid, the new uh, column. And then, uh, because I need to define separately my uh, array with features and target, I'm dropping the type, which is the label, from the original data frame. And finally, I'm normalizing the feature vector <coughs> by taking out the mean and dividing by the standard deviation. This is something that support vector machines and other models that do linear algebra prefer. Just because when you have very, very different order of magnitudes in your variables, it may like mess up your calculations. But you know, in tree-based models, it actually doesn't matter. What did I do? I didn't run my inputs. What did I do again? Oh, whoa. I needed, what, yeah. Import that actually from SciPy. Import that. Okay, so I had to add the import of the stats package from SciPy in order to make the next cell run. I apologize. All here. Let's take a look at our data set. As we mentioned, we have now four columns with decent enough names. And these are the features. And then the labels. Basically, I have about 80% of the objects in the LAE category, which is codified as a zero and about 20% of the objects in the O2 category. So far so good? OK. So main implementation difference is that, as we mentioned, we need new scorers. Scorers. Like we need new way of understanding whether we are close or not close. And so I put it here. A line that shows you in scikit-learn a list all the possible scores that you can implement. And you know you can build your own, but sometimes it's kind of nice to have some inspiration. And these are actually scores that pertains to both uh, classification and regression problem. So you see like accuracy. Okay, you're like eh, classification not helpful. Average precision eh, balance accuracy eh. Now, do you see something that seems like more uh, suitable to some regression problem? Don't, don't pick the weird one that I don't know, OK? 
like this focus mellow score, for example. Let's not talk about this one. <laughs> but if you see something that you can recognize, I'll be happy to discuss. No? What can we pick? Squared error. Mm -hmm. Which one? Mean squared error. Mean squared error, but unfortunately there's these weird things here. What is it? It's a negative mean square error. So the mean square error, or like our MSC, is something that we see often, right? Okay, it's like literally like the average of like the square distance between your predicted value and your true value. Now, why is it neg here? Why should we take the negative of that? Hmm? We want a higher score. We want right. To so all of these. Basically, you know, just to make them like all equivalent, they are written as scores. And so, you know, there's really like nothing deep <coughs> behind it. It's just that because like all of them are set in a way that the higher number means a better result. And so the ones that are errors, this is something that happened like in one of the latest iteration, are like, you know, take the negative of that just to keep the same practice. So, you know, the negative, mean square error, and you also have like the median absolute error, you have the mean absolute error. These are like pretty standard ways of defining the difference between true and target. And so let's see, let's build a regression model using random forest and picking a scoring parameter from the list above. So let's pick this like mean square error, for example. So I'm gonna say model, and I'm going to uncomment, equal, random forest big raster. And you can always like tap your way through everything, so that's nice. And I have to say, you know, if I want default parameters, this is what I would do. And then, I guess, if I want to see some scores of this model, I would say, okay, cross-validation score. And then the model comes first, I call it model. Then our feature vector was this like normalized x, then our uh, target vector, which still has only zero and one, but you know, nothing prevents me from fitting it as a regression model. And I'm gonna say CV equal, this is an unbalanced problem. So this is like a little bit tricky. So if I say CV is equal stratify k fold, then you know I should have something stratified because I know it's like an imbalanced problem, so usually it's an advantage to pick equal combination. But the only reason why I suspect that this will work here is that the algorithm is smart enough to recognize that the labels are actually classes. If I try to do it in a regular regression model, this will not work. So we will see this in a moment. But let me just <coughs> see, let's say n splits equal five, and very important, shuffle equal true. This is important because if the variable are in order and say shuffle equal true, then the false are actually taken as like, you know, the first 20%, the second 40, the second 20%, the third 20%, and this can give lots of issues. So unless it's a time series problem, always shuffle. Okay, let's see what happens. Huh, I got something. So, this means, oh, we didn't pick the scoring parameter. We have to do that. So scoring, we said there's gonna be negative, oh, it doesn't tab, let's see. Negative means square error. Just so it's something we can interpret easily. Yeah, what did I do? I need a comma. Okay. So now, let's see, other than you know, like the weirdness of having the mean square error is written as a negative, this means that for my five folds, I'm gonna get that the average, I'm gonna guess that the average this score is about 0 0.04. And so this means that my typical squared error in this regression problem is about 0 0.04. Which is not bad, considering that the labels are like zero and one. 
right? This means that I'm like sort of like this much away, typically, from a result. I mean, it's hard to. Is it squared? So is it actually? It is squared, although, look at this. Oh, no, okay. It, is, it, uh, is it like, yeah, if I do 0 0.07, yeah, this is kind of confused. Yeah, it's true. So if we want like negative mean absolute error, and we want to sort of roughly interpret as a percent error, like for this like zero and one, let's say that our variables are order unity, then this gives us a sense of you know how far away we tend to be. And again, this is like not the best problem to pick as a regression problem because our input variables are classes, right? And so this is really better thought of as classification. Another uh, Scorer that is actually used often, if I'm not mistaken, is actually the standard in sklearn is this R2 score. And because you'll see it a lot, I thought I would like just go through what it is. So sometimes it's called coefficient of determination, and it's written as R squared. However, even if it's a square, it can be negative. And this is also something that took me a while to understand. But in general, this is the definition where y's are the true values and y hat are your predictions. So this is basically the percentage of the variance that is explained by the prediction. And you know, maybe one way of thinking about it is that if you always predict the mean, since here you have basically like the uh, difference between true values and the mean, if you always predict the mean, this gets to 1, and your coefficient of determination is 0. So a regressory model that always just returns the mean of all the values will have a coefficient of determination of 0. It cannot explain any of the variance in the data with its prediction. However, this can actually go negative. And usually the trick is, you know, if you look at other formulations, the trick is that you will never be negative in your training sample just because of how you build the thing. But on your test value, you can do arbitrarily that. And so basically, if your predictor is performing worse than just predicting the mean of the values, then these can go negative. And the best value, of course, is 1. If there is no difference between the true values and the prediction, this goes to 0. And so 1 means that you have the perfect prediction. However, it's a little bit tricky because it doesn't have an interpretation like a percentage. And this is, I think, always the issue of the regression model. And so something like you know, the mean absolute error, the mean squared error, it's a bit easier to understand. The R2 score, despite the fact that it's very widely used, when you see 0.9, you know that you're doing decently. But it doesn't really translate into something that tells you how far away you are in your prediction from the true value. So we can do the same thing and see what is our coefficient of determination here. And so, and this is actually, yes, I think that I was correct when I was thinking about the standard, the default parameters. I think that the standard scoring parameter is these R2. And let's see. Uh, no, I will not know from here. And so our coefficient of determination is around 0 0.7, 0 0.71. You can look at the mean if you want. But you know, but again, does it mean this sort of like roughly means that 72% of the variance explained in your data can be explained through your predictive model? But it doesn't have a very direct interpretation. So to understand how good our predictions are, I thought, OK, maybe we can, oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, uh, sorry. Like, what is the difference between the R2 and explained variance? Yes, so it's, a, it's a tricky. Like, um, it's in here, you don't have the mean. And that's the explained variance score. So here you just, yeah, this, this, this term goes away. So they're fairly similar, but you're not subtracting the mean. Normalization is different. 
Yeah, I like I remember like I had like the same questions and I looked and I looked at these in the formula and so this is I guess all I can I can say about it. I think like in the conceptual I think that they're very close. It's just like a normalization that changes. I guess it's like that part, it doesn't go to zero if you predict the mean, but it's like more percentage in a way. So it gives you a sense of how far you are in your prediction with respect to the original values. Okay, so to visualize the prediction, we have used cross val score to get the score, to get the predictions, which function should we use? Cross val. Predict, yeah. Okay, and so we have our model, and we have normalized x and y, and I'm gonna copy this from here because I'm lazy. And so this is a function that does your five-fold cross-validation, saving the, the predicted label labels for every test fold. Okay, so now I'm, I have my prediction vector. And I can plot the histogram, so just like, you know, true and predicted, just to see overall what is happening. And so this is, you know, of course, you know, even if it's a regressor, it's not completely stupid. So he understands that, okay, most of the values are either 0 or 1. If this is like all the input that you're giving me, this is what I'm doing. But of course, you see that there are like a bunch of predictions that are somewhat in the middle. So we can try to understand if there is any information there. Like what's the reason that these are predicted not to be zeros and one, which are after all all the examples that this regressing model has seen, and whether this can be used for information. And in general, in a regression problem, if you want to see you know, what's the difference between the truth and the predictions, you can also look at the scalar plot. Do you think it will be informative here? I always make this mistake. I'm like, ah, oh, let me look. So of course, you know, like, typically, if you do the same thing for a classification problems, you just get four points, like zero, one, zero, one. And I mean, like, for this regression problem, yes, you have, like, you know, some distribution with, like, all the points overlapping, so it's not even, like, a density plot. So unfortunately, typically, this is something that you look at in a regression problem, you know, like, what's, like, your true and predicted variable look like? but not quite in this case. So one thing that I thought would be interesting is, can we understand, looking in data space, why some of these predictions are here in the middle? Like ideally, if this classifier, sorry, if this regression model is predicting uh, the probability of the object belonging to, say, the, the positive class, this point, should correspond to objects that are where? Are we more confident or less confident in these labels? Less, right? If you're like, if you're saying, okay, I cannot give you, like if the probability of belonging to a certain class is not very low and not very high, then you imagine this corresponds to things for which you are not sure. And so if we look at this in feature space, even if we have four features, you know, maybe like we'll just like project down to two, we expect that this should be sort of like in the middle, right? We, you know, if this is behaving as we expect, we imagine that we should find that points here should be the same points that we cannot classify with certainty. So this plot here attempts to do this. I'm looking in the space of equivalent width and continuum. The rationale for that is that we also have wavelength information, but we saw from the feature importance that we saw last time that this was the least important variable. And then equivalent width, continuum, and emission line flux, there are actually only two variables are independent out of these three. And so I figured that you know, if we plot these in this like, you know, two-dimensional feature space, this should still give us like a good mapping of what is happening. And I had to play a little bit with the limits, which is why I just put it in here. So what I'm having here is like on the left, 
these are the true labels. There's only two types, so even if I'm using, I guess, a color map of sorts, <coughs> then you have, ah, oh, I didn't even put the labels, so I apologize. Let's have some X label should be W and Y label is containing, whoops. And then I can put them label here. All right. So which ones are the LAEs? The yellow or the purple? Hmm? Purple. Why do you say? Because they have higher equivalent width. Because they have higher equivalent width and low continuum. Which is, you know, these are galaxies that, you know, we're looking at Lyman alpha line, which is a super strong line itself. So the line is strong and the continuum is lower because we're looking at galaxies that are much farther away. And then on the right hand side, you see the predictions. And these predictions, you know, like, of course, like the colors are also mapped through, like, you know, zero through one. And so you can see that most of the are correctly plotted in purple, which means, like, I'm confident of giving them, like, a, you know, a probability you want that they are LAEs, most of the two are predicted to be yellow, and the ones that are in between, and so they have an intermediate color, are actually concentrated in this region, which is the region with the highest overlap between the two types of objects. So I think hopefully this at least you know, shows us that what this regression model is doing makes sense. It's trying to assign a probability that an object belongs to a certain class. And so we'll be able to, to predict zero or one when, you know, with certainty you can say, okay, this class or the other, and intermediate value correspond to objects that are more uncertainty just because of where they are in feature space. Make sense? Ah, okay. Okay, so here we can do a little optimization, and this is, you know, nothing surprising because we're already uh, familiar with random forest models. And so notice that another thing that happens is that you need a new criterion to evaluate the performance of the model. And so you can do have this R2 score. So you also need, if you're looking at, say, a random forest or any tree-based model, you also need a new criterion to, de to decide what impurity means. Remember, for classification problem, we have talked of gene impurity which meant like a measure how much classes were mixed in each box. And then we aim to uh, maximize the decrease of impurity with each split. <coughs> of course, what is happening here for like all three based models is that an end leaf is a leaf in which we make the same numerical prediction. And so how do we classify the impurity of a certain leaf if I have, say, you know, like 50 examples that are all predicting 0.7. Well, I need to specify something, and this something would be, for example, the mean square error, the mean absolute error. In fact, I think that in scikit-learn, the only two that are implemented that you can play with are MSE and MSE, <coughs> like the mean absolute error and the mean square error. So the criterion also to decide whether or not we'll make another split in three base models changes from classification to regression. But other than that, the parameters that we have are similar so like the depth of the tree and the minimum amount of samples required to split are still something that can help with overfitting. Number of estimators is warning, is a warning because you're gonna change it from 10 to 20. And so they like to tell us every time I've suppressed the warning in this notebook, but you know, just so you know. And so the maximum number of features is also something we can play with to enhance randomization, which lowers the variance. Although, you know, in a four feature data set, we don't really expect that is super important. And so this is you know, another uh, grid search optimization that just looks at this simple combination of parameters. And we can run. And a scoring parameter and using the negative mean absolute error just because it's one of the most transparent. And uh, let's see what we had here without any optimization. Just to compare was somewhere 
I guessed around 0 0.07, possibly 0 0.069. So here, let's see, are we done? Yes. And so we're actually not doing much better here. Our best parameters and best score is, again, something like around negative 0 0.068. And it's predicted to be for a pretty high value of maximum depth using all the features and with the number of estimator at 50, which was actually the highest value. So I think we mentioned one thing to keep in mind is that once your optimal model lies at the edge of your parameter grid, it may be helpful to actually you know, keep pushing in that direction because you can have like further improvement just by enhancing this parameter. So we can do the same thing of taking a look at the results. And so here, you can see that you know, there's like a bunch of models that are fairly close to one another. If I had, actually, maybe I can. I'm assuming that I have a column that has the standard deviation of the scores. Let's see. Do I have a standard deviation of score? Yes. So let's also look at these. Right, so I feel like this is helpful because you know, if you want to decide whether this model is really better than this, considering, for example, that it takes twice the time, this is also something that you want to know. Right, and so in this case, these you know, I can't do this difference in my head. You know, like I tried to do some simple arithmetics last time and I failed by two orders of magnitudes. But I'm going to guess that uh, these two models' performances are well within one standard deviation from one another. And so it's also something to keep in mind, you know, if you're looking for uh, the best model. And so, you know, you're, it looks like, you know, they have like the same parameters other than they're here. You're going from 20 to 50 estimators. And so that explains why you have like the higher runtime. And so you, you may decide to go for this one because it takes less time and it performs comparatively well. And let's see, other things that we expect here is uh, if I increase the maximum depth, I would expect uh, to have slight overfitting. And so I expect a bigger difference between the train scores and the test scores compared, for example, to this case in which the maximum depth is only five, which is true, right? You know, things behave as expected, but at the same time, usually I still care about the test scores. And so even if this is a model with higher variance, it's still better for me. Any questions? So what is best for this case, classification or regression? You basically look at the classification problem and recast into a regression problem. But which one do you think is better? Classification. Classification. Why would you say? Um, well, the scores are better. Are they? So this is like a trick, something that I feel like it's hard to quantify. So actually, maybe you guys can help me. So one thing that I did is you know, let's look at the difference between the prediction for like a classifier and a regressor. Now we are not optimizing, but I can say, uh, where did you go? I want to copy a line here. If I create two vectors with the predictions. So this is the prediction from a classifier. And this is a prediction from a regressor. So I thought, let me plot them just to get a sense of how they are different. And by the way, the true values 
like the true ones, I just like shifted them by, I don't know, a little bit, just so we can actually see the tree histogram. So basically you have that the true labels are in orange, and the classifier, of course, is predicting the exact value for most of them, or like, you know, I guess like a couple of failures here that it's attributing to the wrong class. And the regressor is actually, you know, also doing well, but of course is basically like taking some of these values and spreading them around intermediate values that are not allowed by a classifier. So my sense is that if the input data are classes, then you should use a classifier. But this is more common sense. Then I thought, okay, you know, I cannot compare them directly because I cannot compute accuracy for a regressor. But I can do the opposite. I can compute something like R2 score or mean absolute error for a classifier. And so this could be a way to compare them, but actually I'm not convinced that it's reliable. So for example, you know, I can plot the mean absolute error of you know, the predictions of the classifier and the prediction of the regressor. And so in this case, the classifier has a lower mean absolute error. So this is something that may make us say, okay, I guess that you know, a classifier is more suitable to that. However, I feel like uh, this is like something that I just did in passing, but if you do the, oh, oh no, yeah. So if you do, you know, if you look at the R2 score, you actually find a higher value for the regressor. A higher value is better in this case. And so this seems to mean that, you know, like there is like more variance explained by your regressing, your regressor than by your classifier. So, I mean, I feel like, you know, this is like for me, like something that is open for discussion. I, I still think that if your input are classes, there is information in there. But I can't figure out whether this is a fair way to compare a classifier and a regressor. So I don't know if you guys have ideas. You could also go the other way and then just discretize the values that the regressor is giving you for the history. I can, and but actually, like I think the next point <coughs> hopefully shows that they are equivalent. So the last things that I wanted to mention is that last time we saw the many psyche learner list classifier have a predict proba method, where rather than just predicting the class, they predict the probability that an object belongs to a certain class. And we used this when we were building the uh, ROC curve, because this is a case in which to get that graph, you use different thresholds. And so that's why you want to use that probability, and then change the threshold that gives you the classification to one or the other side. And so I thought, OK, I also want to know how this predict probability thing is calculating. And so I compared the probabilities given by a random forest classifier. This is just for like one split, forgive me. Uh, so in which like I fit my trained data, and then I use the predict probability property on the test set. And then I'm comparing them with the direct output of a random forest aggressor applied to the same data and you know, using the predict method on the test fold. So this gives me my two arrays, probus and probus2, and this fits them. And you can say, and you can see that essentially they are the same thing. So to me, what this shows is that under the hood, as they say, if you're asking for this like you know, predict probability to a classifier, what it's doing in the back is running this problem as a regression model and then assigning a class on the basis of that probability. And so, so I'm still, I feel like I don't know, you know, like I think this was helpful for me to understand what predict proba is doing. And you know, you can sort of like do manually yourself running a regressor model, but I'm still, I guess, confused when it comes to how, you know, which one should I use? Because the, using a regressor gives me the additional information 
that you know, for uncertain objects, I get sort of like a measure of confidence, which I think is helpful. Having an object for which I'm predicting 0.5 tells me, hey, this one is really uncertain. But I also feel like if your input are classes, there is information there. And so, yeah, so I don't know. I guess this is like an open point as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Could this work just for binary data? What, what if we have several classes? And how do you interpret the results of the regressor? As, as it's a, yeah, that's a very good point. The only way I can see you could do it is doing the one versus all. So basically, you know, like you would run it several times, uh, defining the positive class each time, and then that gives you that sort of probabilistic interpretations. All right, I think that maybe this is a good time to take a few minutes break. Uh, the only other thing that I wanted to discuss is how to estimate errors in your predictions, which I think could be helpful. And you have one approach, which I'm sure is not complete. So let's say, you know, let's take a few minutes for like coffee or water and whatnot, and let's come back and we can look at these as, you know, the last thing that we see about supervised learning. I thought at least the break would get you enthusiastic, guys. No, there is fruits, there is bagels, there is coffee. Zoom people, are you okay? Do you have any questions? Nope, all good here, thank you. All right, great. Actually, can I ask a quick question? Of course. So uh, I was just looking through the um, the mean test scores for the mm -hmm. SEM from the previous workbook. Yeah. And comparing them to some of the scores that we're looking at here. Yeah. At SVM, I've noticed that the distribution of mean test scores is very skewed. So you go from having a very, very large number of very high test scores and then it kind of just drops off very drastically. Mm -hmm. I was just curious as to whether or not that distribution of test scores reflects the sort of algorithm or scoring method being used, or if it's something that's inherent to the data, or maybe if it's some kind of combination of the two. Uh, oh, that's a great question. Well, it's a support of July. I don't know. I don't know what is the answer. I am tempted to say data have a large Wait, just because I feel like, but actually, no, I don't know with the test scores. I don't know, for example, why there are these models that fail so badly. And so the only way I would think you can answer this is like, you know, you go maybe like you project to the two most important um, uh, dimensions and you plot the decision boundary. Got it, okay and you see what is happening. So, yeah, so I wouldn't know. But the, yeah, I mean, when I look at it, I was also saying, how can something achieve only like 20%? How can you be so bad? And what I'm seeing here is a high degree polynomial or high values of gammas. And these are both indications of a very uh, irregular boundary, like a feature rich boundary. And so what I'm guessing is that because like there are many, objects that are close to the boundary, having like a very wiggly one 
would cause you to do pretty bad. But yeah, so that's my best guess, but I wouldn't know more without actually seeing them. Okay, thanks. I guess I'll probably just have to test it. Yeah, yeah, I guess. If you can, that would be great. All right, guys. So let's see. Last thing that we have in this notebook, and I thought it was you know worth mentioning at least once, is it's all good. We have machine learning. We put it in this magic box, not a magic box. And now we get some prediction, but in physics, or in science in general, you know, you can never have a result without an error bar. And so the idea is like, how can I, and usually your input data also have error bars. And so, you know, how can we evaluate what's the uncertainty <coughs> on our predictions? And how can we incorporate um, the uncertainties that you have on your inputs? And my answer is actually pretty simple and it's just like bootstrap. And uh, honestly, I haven't really thought about the subtleties of, obviously you have like an error that comes from your method, right? And so when we think about scores and we have like an accuracy, there is obviously an uncertainty that is associated to the method itself, uh, like the architecture of your machine learning method. And whether or not this is independent of this, I think is debatable and I don't have a good sense of how to answer that. But you know, just in terms of how does experimental error feature into this process, I think that something that looks like a fair way is to basically create a bunch of data sets that sort of like scatter around your input variables by an amount that is dictated by your experimental error, and then look at the predictions uh, and do it enough times that you can actually get a sense of the spread or even a distribution. And it seems to me that this should work. So just to have another example, remember that in our data sets we have these three feature equivalent weight continuum and emission line flags that are not independent. In fact, roughly the equivalent width is the ratio of the other two. Uh, modulo like you know, uh, errors and whatnot. So I'm just assuming that you know, if I pick two, I should be able to predict the third quite well, just so that we can see without having to deal with new data, like another example of regression problem. And so now I'm going to look at my features, it's going to be these two columns equivalent with a continuum, and my target is predicting uh, the emission line flux. And so now I have a little data sets with about 5,000 instances and only two features, and my target is just like a one-dimensional array. Excuse me. Um, you know, I can, as usual, have my prediction, and we can do here CV equal five. Actually, notice what I was telling you earlier, which is now 
my labels are truly numerical. I'm not playing around with this zero and one and pretending that they are continuous numbers. And so if I try to use a stratified k-fold here, and I say something like that, and splits equal five, and okay, shuffle equal true, I get an error. So I thought that this is interesting because earlier I was doing exactly the same thing. But just because the labels were numerical, like my algorithm was like, I know you're trying to do something strange, but hey, your input are classes, and so I know how to understand that and model that distribution. But normally, you sort of lose the ability to target to the uh, rare objects or to a skewed distribution when you're using a simple regression model. So this is something also to keep in mind that may skew us towards using classification when you're looking for a rare class of objects. So let's see what I said to myself. Let's look at a couple of evaluation metrics and also make a scatter plot. All right, so because now we can actually do a scatter plot and it will make sense because we are predicting numbers that have a continuous distribution, not these like just weird corners. So we can see, for example, what's the uh, mean absolute error of always the, these are symmetric, but always the real first and then the prediction after. Okay, so this is about 0 0.05. Now remember that we have sort of standardized the feature. So they are of order unity. So this is not quite a percentage, but you know we get the sense. So this is not bad. We can look at our two scores to see, hey, you know, are we doing reasonably well here? Yeah, look at these R2 scores. It's 96.5%. Uh, so it's, actually, I shouldn't say percent. It's 0 0.965, which means in a world where zero means I have no predictive power, and one is the best possible value, even if this is not a percentage, it means, hey, I'm doing quite well. I'm quite good at predicting this value. Then we can make a scatter plot and say, okay, PLT to scatter, la 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 la, tap, tap, tap. And then let's see. Um, first, target, then white red. I don't like the blue color. And I should say. <coughs> Uh, uh, why do you do this to me all the time? Right, so you can see that, you know, the reason probably by the coefficient determination is so high, even if we see a decent amount of scatter here is that probably this contains a ton of points, right? And so I feel like that's always like the trick of using like visuals is that typically we are not sensitive to the density of points. And so we're like, oh, well, this is okay here, but not so great here when we are looking at uh, high values of like the emission line flux, but at the same time, you know, if we were sort of like to histogram this out of the board, probably we'll get that, you know, a vast majority of our points are here. And so in the end, these points that have like, you know, higher dispersion contribute less to like the overall evaluation metric. So this seems to say, okay, we are doing fine. Um, now, how can I estimate, how can I add an error bar, essentially, to these estimates? And so my idea was like, okay, let's build, for example, 10 bootstrap samples, which means that for every input instance, for every instance or object that I have, I sort of like, you know, scatter the value of the input features by an amount that should be dictated by what my actual experimental error is. And here I'm just saying it's about 1% of the original value. Okay, and so what I'm doing here is that I'm saying, okay, I'm creating a new array that will contain basically 10 new data sets. And so for each one of these 10 new data sets, I build a new row with the features, which is like the original value, plus 
some sort of you know like Gaussian scatter with uh, zero mean and the standard deviation proportional to the error, actually equal to the error that I'm assuming. I'm doing the same thing for the continuum. And so my new feature array is going to be basically this, you know, I'm just like joining these two columns together and then I have to transpose just to put them in the correct shape. And then my bootstrap prediction for this data set will be built as a cross-validate predict of my new array with the old target values. Hopefully this makes sense. So of course it takes a minute to run, but you know it's a small data set, random forests are fast, so it's already done. And here, uh, this basically prints the prediction <coughs> and its standard deviation. And so my best idea is we can use the standard deviation as a proxy for the uncertainty. Sorry, this is really a poorly formatted output. But remember that here, because I have standardized things, you know, like they have mean zero, and so they tend, you know, they are positive and negative. And so finally, what I'm getting here, what I'm doing here is an error bar plot. Well, the x value is the true value of the numerical uh, labels I'm trying to predict. Uh, the main point is my original prediction. And then the error is the standard deviation that I obtain with this bootstrap procedure. And so you can see that even with this relatively small, actually I was a bit surprised, but you know, I don't know. I think like it seems like a fairly straightforward pipeline, uh, but even with this fairly small error, I found a lot of deviation in like you know, like sort of like a higher than expected uh, uncertainty in my values. But this seems to me like this is like the fair way of adding error bars to this plot. Now, how this relates to the error that you have from the algorithm itself, I don't know. I think in many cases, one of them is dominant, and so in some sense, their correlation becomes less important. But you know, this is by no means like a rigorous statistical analysis of all the contributions of error, but I think this is a fair way of including the effect of experimental error in your input variables in your prediction. And I mean, what we are assuming here is that the error are uh, distributed normally around the mean, but actually you, know, you could do bootstrap samples that model a different error distribution fairly. So overall, I think that this should be like general enough, even when your errors are not Gaussian. What do you guys think? Do you have other ideas? Makes sense? This data set, yeah, just visually that you see that the scatter is much higher for a larger value than flood. So you might consider like a, you know, a, a fractional error rather than a, you know, the absolute error, or something like that. Well, well, may I consider this, or should I consider using the fractional error as? Because this is what we did when we model the error. I yeah. use one percent of the actual value. But it's surprising for the on the left side that you would get that much. Scatter. Right, yeah, I was surprised as well. And actually, it's also somewhat surprising that you get like, you know, different values. But one thing that one should do, I mean, it's possibly doing is like, you know, see what happens if you do a higher number of samples. Like maybe 10 is not quite high enough. So we can take a look at what happens with 20. And I mean, I guess that you know, with 20, you do see that maybe like these are sort of like stabilizing towards a lower value, and these are like in general bigger. But yeah, I was also thinking that for like you know, using like a one percent <coughs> scatter, I was expecting a smaller thing. I mean, also I guess this is like the flux. What should it be like? What what mathematical operation are we doing? Um, we have equivalence with and continuum. So we are dividing the equivalent width by the continuum. Is that correct? The equivalent width is like 
the flux divided by continuum. So flux is like equivalent with times continuum. Okay. So I mean, if like the thing that is unclear to me is like how much of these also includes like the algorithm error, because you know like the fact that you have a fluctuations in your scores every time you run it is also included in here. So one, yeah. one thing I did was to just turn off the perturbations to both of the factors separately. Say it again? So you can turn off the, the random perturbators mm -hmm. that you're adding to both equivalent width and continuum and then see how the errors change. So, so separately? So for one, if you just add errors to the continuum. Add? Uh, sorry, I can't hear very well. Sorry. So you're, you're, you're perturbing both the equivalent width and yes. the continuum values. Yes. So you can perturb them individually. Oh, yeah. And see what the errors are right. doing. And so all the errors are coming mainly from the perturbations to the equivalent width. OK. So it could be more related to what depth that feature is at. Mm -hmm and how much perturbing it changes the, the decision tree in, in what it ends up deciding. Right, so definitely. If it's, if it's a feature at a, a lower depth, then it will propagate errors through uh, the entire tree and end up giving you more errors. Definitely, I agree, I agree 100%. I just felt like, on the one hand, when we were building the important, as you imagine, we actually sort of like all got random perturbation of the three most important features. Because when you have three features and only two are truly independent, this is what we expect. And it's interesting. I mean, if you turn it off, like Parkin was saying, it actually looks quite a bit more reasonable. You just change the. Yeah, the, on the other hand, yeah. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. The equivalent width one, if you just change then the. So basically, I'm not changing the equivalent width. Yeah, well, you can, yeah, yeah, exactly. Correct. Oh, also, I said that I would do it 20, but then I didn't change it here. So let's do one thing at a time. Okay. Oh, what happened? Oh, no. I guess that I have one value that went crazy. Try it again. Yeah. yeah. Should I restart my computer? <laughs> okay. Yeah. I see. Yeah, yeah, it's true. <coughs> And this is also behaving somewhat as you expect, having like smaller or real tablet. On the other hand, the equivalent width seems like, you know, like you should have. Yeah, it just seems very sensitive to the equivalent width. So maybe, yeah. you know, 1% change in the equivalent width is actually more than you would expect. Oh, that's quite interesting. Maybe like my own worksheet exercise workshop exercise would be like, okay, let's figure out why this is more sensitive to equivalent with than anything else. Let's see what happens with 20. I don't think that this will make a difference, but I'm curious. Hmm. No, not a big change. Oh, well, I guess that, you know, it would be nice looking at the equivalent with again and see uh, what, like see if something is a distribution, sort of like, uh, gives us clues of why we are so sensitive to that particular value. Because we said the flux is equivalent with times continuum, right? So we sort of like, naively, you would expect that the way these two contribute to the error should be similar, given that you're essentially calculating the product of two variables. All right, science, full of open-ended questions that I don't know the answer to. But anyway, just as a conclusion, in regressions we have quantities, not classes. We can use the same algorithm, but typically the evaluation metric change, and we want to trace how close we are to the true values. And we can use bootstrap to include the individual errors in our predictions. And also, it turns out to do sort of like informal feature importances by sort of like, you know, getting an idea of how much perturbations in one variable participate in the overall uh, error budget or, you know, like how much fluctuation they would give in the prediction. Um, I wonder if we can demonstrate that the values that are, have like the highest correlation coefficient with the result uh, should participate more here. And well, this is sort of like a shameless plug, but you know, if you want to have like also another worth example 
of regression. This is a paper that I wrote four years ago, so you know how you're always kind of embarrassed in going back to the code that you wrote four years earlier, and it's like, you know, it's full of weird things. But basically what I was doing here is an exercise in predicting the gas phase metallicities of SCSS galaxies, looking at the photometric features. And so I, have, I was playing with magnets, but I also played with colors, and I tried to do some feature engineering and have like squares of that. And so you, what you expect if this page ever loads is you sort of recover the mass metallicity relation, but you can tighten it, demonstrating that you, know, you can use other available information to predict metallicity more uh, precisely. And well, anyway, this doesn't quite load, but basically I put uh, online all the notebooks for that. And so you know, they can like download the galaxies and look at these works. And there are like five examples, actually examples of five full regression algorithms. And you know, like, oh, that's not how it typically looks. I'm guessing that my Wi-Fi here is not too happy. But anyway, if you want, you know, you're welcome to look. And you know, if you have like, you know, if you want to do like a full, uh, you know, optimization or like a whole bunch of different algorithms, you can take a look at these. So, are you ready to move on to unsupervised territory? Yes. So I guess that this is all we say. And so the one thing I wanted to talk about is clustering, and then hopefully next time we can see an actual examples with galaxy morphology. And I have to tell you in advance, it works very poorly. <laughs> but I think you know there's like a lot that you can learn from like attempting it. And then if we have time, we can look at some simple dimensionality reduction techniques on images. So bye bye to this one. Any more regression questions or supervised questions? No, Zoom people, do you have any more questions on anything supervised? Not many, no. Okay. So I was playing around with the, yeah. you know, the Monte mm -hmm. Carloing, and yeah. if you turn off both of them, you still get scatter, and I don't understand. I know. Well, this is fair, though, right? Because the predictions, you know, and this is why you get, like, you know, scattering your scores. Because, you know, like, it's a randomized algorithm. And so, and actually, this is why, I don't know if you noticed, but here, uh, I was, you know, using like the original prediction, but if you look at, uh, if you use like the mean of the whole predictions, it's still like a different value. And so yes, and that's why I was saying I think that this error budget actually includes everything because it includes the fluctuations that you get from the algorithm itself, the fact that the prediction are not always the same because the algorithm is not perfect. This is what the sort of deviation in the scores tells you about, right? You know, there's randomization in each one of them, and so you don't get this. And you also get, like, the ones due to the error. And I think here you're looking at the combination of the two. This still doesn't explain why the equivalent will participate so strongly, but, but I think, you know, this is what we are seeing, is that, you know, you see the uncertainty due to the fact that the algorithm is, I don't even want to say not perfect, but, you know, the fact that you are building a set of randomization already. And so for this particular like random forest or like three based methods, I expect that this will happen. Uh, it would be interesting to see what happens, for example, with SVMs, in which you don't have that. And so with the same data, you really expect the same predictions. And so perhaps one can isolate the effect of the experimental error better that way. All right, the ship is sailing. So we let it go away. Do you guys still want a moment to collect your thought about regression? I'm gonna take it as no. So bye bye. And this of course, like this actually, let me save it, I will upload the field notebooks in case you wanted to take a look or you missed something. And, okay, and so let's see if we can, yeah, take a little detour into uh, unsupervised 
learning. So as we mentioned, you know, the two uh, typical applications of unsupervised learning are like grouping objects. And so what we have is either clustering of some type or this combined with trying to reduce the dimensionality of our data set. It could be because we have CPU time issues or it could be just because we want to identify the most important things. And so, and this is actually a topic, you know, I've been teaching this machine learning class for three semesters, and this is a topic that uh, my good friend and colleague Ashwin at Sysitech has been teaching my class, so I've been like extremely reusing some of his slides, and this is like, he was actually, is a really interesting person who did like the opposite um, of what many academics do, and so he has his PhDs in computer science, exactly on clustering, and he worked in Microsoft Research for seven years, and then he decided to leave and join academia. And so he's been like my colleague at Citadel ever since. And you know, we often hear about the opposite, but this is not quite common. Uh, all right, so what is clustering? In general, we say that you know, we want to create a group of objects. And typically, your goal is that objects in the same group or clusters are as similar to each other as possible. And objects that do not belong to the same clusters are uh, as far from each other as possible. So you want to minimize the intra-cluster distances and you want to maximize the inter-cluster distances. Now it seems like you know, fair and easy, usually depends on how your data look like, but for example in here, how many clusters would you say there are? Six. Right, or? Two or two. Right, and so this is, you know, even to humans who are usually very good at picking up patterns like this, you know, you could reasonably argue that there are two clusters, you could reasonably argue that there are six clusters, probably none of us will really argue that there are four clusters, but you know, you can imagine distribution in which this happens. So it's not as trivial a problem as it seems. Uh, there are many types of clustering according to what we are trying to do. The only one that I mentioned, because if we have time, we could actually see how they work, is partition clustering, which basically you have uh, a division and each data object is in exactly one cluster, and hierarchical clusters in which you can have like nested clusters, and so one object may belong to several of them. And so if you have these points, uh, these are both examples of partition clusters. Here you have two, each point is in one, here you have only one, fair enough. And hierarchical clustering would look like this. And so in this case, you have like first big one, and then you further cluster these, and then you further cluster these, sort of according to an increasing degree of similarity, or something like that. And so they have their, you know, they're easy to understand through this diagrams of you know, how you're making part of splits that are called dendrograms. Now, from a mathematical perspective, what do we do to achieve this clustering? We know that we want to divide objects, and we know that we want to make objects that are in the same clusters close, and we, want to, and we know that we want to make objects that are in different clusters far away. So usually we cast it as an optimization problem. And so uh, what we want to do is, just like in any machine learning algorithm, or really any model fitting algorithm, we will have an objective function. The objective function, sometimes we call it like loss function. In this case, you know, if you're maximizing this is something that's okay, if this is big, it means that my division is successful, and this is small, it doesn't. And so one way of going about it is to enumerate all the possible ways that you have to divide points into clusters and then find the one that maximizes or minimizes your objective function. This is an NP-hard problem, and so usually we don't want to deal with those. And you know, a variation of those is that you can have a parameterized model. So for example, mixture models are a way in which rather than considering all the possible distribution of your data, you um, assume that there is like an underlying series of mathematical distribution, for example, Gaussian distributions, and you try to fit the parameters of those. And this is one way to reduce the possible combination that you have to find. Now, the one algorithm that we will start with, and you know, it's very simple, but as usual, I feel like you know, it's a good 
uh, starting point is k means. And k means is so called because you build k clusters and then the centroids of these clusters are the arithmetic means of the coordinates. Which I'm telling you because for years I thought the k means was like what means was a verb, and so I was like, yeah, I've been wondering what it meant for a long time, and then I realized that actually there was like means as average, not like k means something. So it's a partitional clustering approach. One of the main weaknesses that it has, as we will see, is that you need to tell it how many clusters you expect, or you know how many clusters you want to have. And this is in general, you know, when you're just doing that exploration, oftentimes you don't know how many you have, which makes it, you know, a little bit tricky. And so each cluster has its center point. It actually doesn't need to be a point in the data set, and it's just calculated. It's called a centroid, and it's just calculating as the mean of all the points that are assigned to these clusters. And then the way that we classify that is that once we have our centroids, basically we assign each point to uh, the closest centroid, right? So say like I have four for every point, I say okay, I can calculate the distance to each point to the four centroids, the one with the mean with the smallest distance means okay, now I'm assigning it to you. And the objective is to minimize the sum of the distances of the points to their respective centroids. And so for each one of the clusters, you will look at how far the points are from a centroid, and the best centroids are the one that you know, sort of like minimize the sum of the distances of their members. So rewritten as mathematics, it means that if I'm creating k clusters, I want to put to group my points into k clusters that I call these, such that basically uh, I my cost function, the things that I want to minimize is here in this internal cell, there I have for every point that belongs to the highest clusters, I want to minimize the sum of the distances between each point and its centroid. And this, of course, this is also summed over all the clusters. Because if I can make it, you know, like a nice tiny clusters and it's like, you know, all the points are close to the centroids, but then you know, all the other points are very far from the others, that also doesn't help. So this basically weights all the points. The same, which is, as we will say, another one of the limitations of the algorithm. And that distance, the interesting thing, and I think you know, like one of the nicest way to generalize this is that this distance, this distance could be anything, right? I can define my own distance. And so usually when you want in particular to give some guidelines to the algorithm, say, hey, I want these two objects to be close, one way you could do it is to tune that distance. But the most <coughs> typical uh, examples is the one in which that distance oops, is just the Euclidean distance between points. But it doesn't need to be like this. So this just means that you're working in feature space and you're looking for the things that are most clustered in feature space. But if you want to say, for example, I care more about the distance in this dimension compared to this other dimension, this is where you could actually make your modifications. And this is, yeah, I mean, I've been dreaming of playing with this for one problem for a long time. If I can do it by Thursday, I will show you. But um, realistically, probably not. So what's the pseudocode for k means? So so-called, I feel like, so they call it expectation maximizations, but I don't really like this terminology a little bit because, I don't know, it's, it doesn't like really race to me. But the idea is like, first, let's pick k points. You have to say, you know, you want three clusters, four clusters, five clusters, and so you, you give like, you know, five <coughs> initial coordinates. And then you repeat these two things. You form the clusters by assigning all the points to the closest centroid. Right? So for every point, you calculate the distance to the k centroid that you have and you assign that point to the cluster whose centroid is closest. And so this gives you now like a, a tentative assignment. And now that you have your tentative assignment, you can recalculate your centroids by taking the arithmetic means of the coordinates of all the points that have been assigned to a certain cluster. 
don't know if I have. I have like a nice little um, web form that we can use to play. So I'm not going to go to the board just because it would be like a poorer approximation of that. And then at this point, you have the new centroids. And you can repeat this procedure with the new centroid. You reassign the points, and then you calculate the new centroids. And then you can imagine, you can think that the algorithm has conversed when the location of the centroids doesn't change anymore, which is also means that the assignment of points to clusters doesn't change anymore. Yeah? But are you sure that this is going to be like, I don't know, like a fully? No. It's going to be a local minimum, I guess, no? Exactly. And this is one of the main issues that k-means has. So there are no guarantees with this procedure that even if you have converged, you have converged to the optimal solution. And so uh, we will talk briefly about the different things that you can say. But so, so one of the problem is initialization. So if you choose a coordinate at random, in particular, you have high probability. If there is like a local minimum, which means like you know a suboptimal configurations of clusters that still has you know like a, a decent value of sometimes it's called inertia that's some square error so that cost function. Yeah, you're likely, you know, like you can pick like you know a random um, state for your initial centroids, and especially when they happen to be close to one another, you're more likely to end up in a local minimum. Because maybe like for some points that are far away will be assigned to one, and then you're still, you know, you're left with a distribution that has like you know a few clusters close to one another. So one way to solve this is to run the algorithm multiple times. And then you can select the cluster that has the smallest error, which is you know, like what we do in MCMC. When we say you have to run multiple chains, start in different areas of uh, the parameter space. And so you know, hopefully, you can make sure that you have converged to the global minimum if you have found the bunch. A better solution, which is actually also using MCMC, is like, you know what? Your starting point shouldn't be random. You, should do it. you can start with finding the farthest I can't say this in English. The points, the k points belonging to your data set that are farthest away from each other. And usually this means that you have to cover the longest path to actually get to your optimal solutions. And this is typically a good way to uh, make sure that you get to that global minimum as opposed to that local minimum. And in this case, uh, this is called sometimes k means plus plus. And so you can, typically the algorithm converges uh, fairly quickly. Uh, and you, know, you can think of the stopping condition as either your inertia, the sum of squared error is not changing anymore, or the centroids is not change anymore, or only like a small fraction of the points are changing assignment from one to the other. So mathematically it can be um, formulated different ways. And the complexity is linear in almost everything. So I guess, you know, according to what your data set is, can be good or bad. So it's linear in a number of points, it's linear in a number of clusters, it's linear in the number of iterations, it's linear in the dimensionality of your data space. So what are the limitations? There are several. One is the fact that often you want to know what is the optimal number of clusters. There are ways around it, but you know, in general for K-means, you need to tell in advance how many you want. And then there are also, you know, another big thing that I guess like I meant to highlight, but this is not quite highlighted, is the fact that k-means cannot actually find clusters that are not globular. I should say in general, but they're not convex. So if you have like a smiley face, then basically it cannot pick out clusters that, you know, in which you know you can get outside the shape of the cluster by connecting two points in the cluster. Also, uh, if clusters have significantly different sizes or densities, this is also a problem because you know, it's weighing all points in the same manner. And this means that it would tend to privilege uh, areas that are dense and have more points. Because they will participate more to the calculation of inertia. So let's say, for example, here uh, is in this case, you may end up with this distribution. 
because the k-means will tend to make all of these clusters of similar sizes, even if they aren't to begin with. And same thing here, you may end up with something like that. Like it will not like pick up the separation of these two because as you can imagine, these are like you know, reasonably closer and there's like so many points that overall they would give you a fairly good sum of square errors. And this is another example that we'll actually see in code this because there is a, a really nice function called make moves that I want to use. And so in this case, this is a case in which the clusters are not uh, convex. And this is what k-means would do with them. So it's not able to pick up non-convex shape for the clusters. And you know, how do you overcome these limitations? The most common um, <coughs> approach is to actually increase the number of the clusters. But then it basically requires semi-supervision in order to understand what's going on, or you know, like, sort of like group them together. So you can, you know, if you have like, you know, I don't know, one, two, three, like what is like ten clusters instead, you will pick up the sub, pick out the subcomponents that you want, but then you will still need to be able to put this together. And same things here. If you have like more than three, you'll be able to separate those two out there, but then you know you will need to decide for yourself whether those are the same cluster. And you know something similar can happen here. But you know, the answer to that may be just to uh, either know how many clusters you need in advance, which is like a good way, or to use a different algorithm that is maybe better suited to dealing with these issues. Sorry. Yeah? Can you, can you go to layers, like start with a big number of, of centroids, and then use the centroids as the new point for another clustering iteration? Yeah, so this is, yeah, actually I did it like in code. So this is basically sort of like a manual implementation of hierarchical clustering, if I understand correctly. Right? Or well, I'm, So you're saying I'm we start saying, with so the large so numbers? You, start, you, you had that example with the, with the 10. Uh, yeah. With that, so you start with that, then we get to, you get to that level, now you treat each centroid mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as an object, <coughs> and you rerun the, the algorithm with new centroids using the old centroids as the as the element of the set and see how the centroids cluster. Oh. So you, you basically get a good clustering and then you recluster the clusters using the centroids as as a, And this is to reduce the number of dimensions that you have. To so reduce it and go back hopefully to like a three to cluster the three. situation. I guess that I'm still it's still unclear to me whether you would end up with because what you're hoping to get from there is that you will have this, this and this. Right? That this will cluster in the center. But it's unclear to me whether this tree will end up here or end up here. And so I feel like without looking, you know, I feel like I'm sure that there are some cases in which it works, but sort of like in an automatic manner, I'm not so sure. Other questions? Yeah. So, so the very nice idea of the super vector machine, you know, to go into higher dimension, is something that can be done here? Maybe you go to higher dimension, and maybe these clusters are but, easier to. But you're reducing the cluster. So here you're sort of like almost hoping to go the other way, right? Of reducing the space and see what kind of things, what kind of objects are close. I think in like your smiley face ones, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same idea. If in, in a higher dimension, they would be they, convex. Yeah, right. You can find some place where then they would actually be close to each other. It's cool. It just like I have, I don't know, it would be fun to try. Like I can't quite imagine how you I mean, would set like your magic, mapping. It, it, it seems like magic in the support vector. Right, so right. But, but the point is like that's a supervised thing. And so yeah, it seems magic, but you're giving some guidance. You know, these are close, these are not. The point is like here you can't. And so I struggle to figure how you can do this mapping to sort of like achieve what you want. But maybe, you know, maybe there are so the transformations that are suitable for so that. I feel like Kartik has ideas, and I think he has played with this a lot. 
traffic illuminators. One thing you can do is use topological methods once you're done this sort of k-means with a lot of centroids. Mm -hmm. uh, you can then use the centroids to construct a graph. Mm -hmm. And then you start filling in edges, faces, and then volumes and so on. And bit, like if, if essentially a, a node is connected only to an adjacent node, then that remains as an edge. If there's a cyclic, like if it's if the, an entire face is connected, you color the face in and you project it to one higher dimension and so on. And so there's a technique of doing this called making persistence diagrams. Making sorry? Uh, persistence diagrams. Okay. So you essentially see like do these simplices, uh, like these these different dimensional structures persist <coughs> if you change the minimum edge length or something like that. So if you change sorry the minimum. The so. When you make, when you take something like this and you turn it into a graph, mm -hmm. you need to specify which of the centroids are going to be connected okay. to each other. Mm -hmm. And so you can say that any centroid within a certain distance of like any other centroid will be connected. So you're, mm -hmm. there's this parameter which is like the length of an edge. Okay. So it has to be at least, like it has to be under some maximum edge length. And as you change the edge length, you see which of these structures persist. I see. So and like, this gives you a guarantee of, like, what, what does this help with? So this, in, in the end, like, the, the parts of your graph that end up being the most persistent mm -hmm. are usually parts of a cluster, overall. I see. I can't say that I fully understand, okay. but I can see that yeah. there okay. must be, like, that this is probably the way of, like, remapping things right. to make them more clusterable. I might have a good link that explains this better than I can, <laughs> so I can send that around. Yeah, wonderful. We can put it in the group. That would be great. Yeah. And I guess last thing that I want to show you is this. Oh, this is sort of like assuming that the internet works. Because so this was like, you know, it's one of these sort of like nice visualization where you can choose the shapes and you can choose the numbers. And you can see how things change. So I really hope that it will work. Do you guys, do you guys have any internet issues? Yep. Yeah. 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 I don't even have my... Oh. Oh no. How do I pick the initial centroids? Farthest point. That's what we said. Yes, let's do it. I mean, this is just for like playing. OK, what kind of data would you like? Smiley face? <laughs> OK, here is your smiley face. Now, shall we add the centroid? How many clusters do you want? Four. Four. Let's do it. One, two, three. So this is, you know, like picking the largest possible distances, as you can say, and then you can do go. And so this is the assignment that you start with, right? Because each point has been assigned to the closest centroid. Now we can say update centroids. And where are they going to move? Let's say in the top, I imagine like maybe a little bit towards the eyes, because now they're going to be like the means of all the points assigned to that. Here we go. Then we reassign the points based on the new centroids. <coughs> then we update, reassign, update, reassign, update. You can see that at this point, they're changing very little. However, is it like a nice classification? No, it really has, and this is you know, like how you see the limits. It really has no relation to the shapes you want to find. So let's do it again. Let's now look for maybe Gaussian mixer. OK, this is something we should be able to pick. So let's see, add how many? Three. three, hopefully. OK, so we have three. And this is like the farthest. Let's do go and update and reassign and update. And you can see that this has converged. And of course, this was like a very easy distribution with like you know globular similar side clusters. Let's pick something. Let's see randomly what happens. 
even with this. <coughs> wap, wap, wap. Oh, this didn't seem random to me. <laughs> but anyway, well, we have to talk. <laughs> Let's do furthest point. And I don't know, pack circles? Oh, this is going to be a tricky one. Like, I don't have a sense of how this will do. So let's see, how many centroids should we pick? One, seven. Right, like, like a flower, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. OK, go. So this actually worked quite well. But you can see that if I had started with five or eight, I think it would have been significantly messed up. So let's see. Let's see what happens with the with five. One, two, three, four, five. So five is not actually too far from the actual number of seven. That's why I feel like Okay, it's not terrible, I guess. Like we lose our center one, but yeah. Yeah, I would say so too. Okay, one more. Density bars, let's see, this is like something that we mentioned, the fact that if there is like a place in parameter space that has higher density, then this can also be an issue. So here we expect three. <coughs> Let's go. So actually with three, we did decently well. Let's see, Let's see what happens with random points. One, two, three. Okay, go. Yeah, so do you see that this, like with random initial conditions, there were two points, two centroids that were quite close to one another. And because of that, we have converged to the solution that is actually not optimal, right? Because I feel like, and so while having like the farthest possible point as initial conditions, helped us recover like this bigger cluster in the middle and then this one being out here. So hopefully this is like a nice visual example of why choosing the farthest points is better than just having random condition, especially when two of those points end up starting fairly close to one another. All right, so that's all from my side from today. Do you guys have more questions? Is there a quantitative way to say that five points is going to be better than seven, or seven is six? So what's, you know, for this algorithm, there is this so-called like elbow method, which is basically a sense of you can get like the sum of squared error, which is the overall optimization function that you have. And you can look at it for various number of clusters. And in general, you expect that this will decrease uh, as you increase the number of clusters, because the distances usually are bigger for fewer clusters. And then at some point, it, like if we're lucky, if there is an optimal number, it will sort of plateau. And so looking at where that elbow is, is usually like a good uh, measure of what the optimal number is. And so I will, we will see it in like a notebook, just a, like a simple way. There are other things, like there is this sort of thing called like this silhouette analysis and I think, but to me like this elbow method is the one they understand also like, you know, it's a very simple. Anything else? All right, well, uh, nice to see you once again. Thanks for coming on the Tuesday. Thank you, all very generous.